Well, thanks for the different kind of introduction. <laughs> Good to be with you again this morning. And we're going to go back to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to look at some more of the results of justification. We read the first couple of verses last week, and uh, we're going to read from verse 1 through verse 11 uh, this morning. Paul tells us, first of all, that having been justified, we have a new relationship. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a new standing through whom also we have obtained, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and a new prospect and rejoice in hope of the glory of God and a new perspective. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us, and a new assurance. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for this man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And a new joy. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You notice there at the end of uh, verse 5, he tells us that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I suppose that that could mean our love for God. That's one way of reading that expression, isn't it? The love of God, our love for God. It's something that uh, the Holy Spirit has shed abroad in our hearts. The fruit of the Spirit is, is love. If we love God, it's because God by his spirit has moved in our hearts and he has caused us to respond and we love him because he first loved us. But the other way of looking at it, and I think the more obvious way of looking at it is that it refers to God's love for us. God's love for us has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God is love. He always was. God is three persons, and in eternity past, within the Godhead, there was love. There was fellowship, and oneness, and joy, and delight, and there was love. The Lord Jesus said it in his prayer to his Father. He says, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And he could say elsewhere that I love the Father. And so within the Godhead, there was love. That's the way it always lo was. Love is older than the universe. And uh, that circle of love has been extended to include us. And we have been brought as believers in the Lord Jesus, we've been brought into this relationship with God and we are loved and we are assured that we are loved because the Holy Spirit testifies to that. He has been poured out in our hearts and therefore we are assured and that we are and always will be loved of God. Now with that, John, uh, Paul then proceeds in verses 7 through 10 to tell us a number of things about God's love. And there are three that I want to uh, share with you this morning. First of all, he talks about the objects of God's love. And he talks about uh, us, and uh, the description he gives is not very flattering. In one sense, when we look at uh, men and women, there is something uh, dignified. Uh, there is something to be honored about uh, human beings. We hear these days that black lives matter. Well, human lives matter. Uh, people are important. Life is sacred. Uh, but there's another perspective. There's another way of looking at us. And so Paul describes that here in these verses. And he says in verse 6, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly. That's what we are. 
Yeah, okay, so we're human beings created in the image and the glory of God. And so there is something special about us. And nevertheless, Paul says we are, we are ungodly. Goes back to the first chapter of this letter where he tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Ungodliness means that we haven't given God the place in his life which he deserves. Ungodliness. I think maybe the best definition of ungodliness is in, the, is in Psalm 36, where the psalmist says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They ignore God. They have no time for God. That's the way we were. Godliness, you see, godliness is in the first place a, a, a recognition of God and who he is, some kind of appreciation of the person of God. And that appreciation, it results in fear and uh, an awesome regard for God. And that in turn results in a way of life conduct that corresponds with the character of God. But these folks, well, us, before we came to know the Lord Jesus, this is us, ungodly, knowingly and willfully ignoring God and going after gods of our own, ungodly. And then he adds to that in verse 8, and at the end of the verse he says, well, we were still sinners. Sinners doesn't get any better. Now, of course, he's told us that before in this letter also. He has said in chapter 3 that we've all sinned, whatever else we might say, and put on our uh, biography, well, whatever else we might say, we can all say this, we sinned, something that's true of everyone. And moreover, we continue to fall short of the glory of God. But it gets worse. You notice verse 10. He says, if when we were, we were enemies... We were enemy, enemies. We were, there was hostility towards God. It wasn't just that we left God out of our lives, but Paul would say to us that uh, we were opposed to God. We resisted God. We were disobedient towards God. And so there was that attitude of hostility towards him. And in turn, God regarded us as his enemies. We were enemies. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. And if that wasn't bad enough, go back to verse 6, and he says there, we were without strength, without strength. In other words, we, could, we couldn't do anything about it. We, we were in this um, desperate situation, but we were altogether incapable of uh, remedying the situation. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. We couldn't do anything about it. But... While we were ungodly, Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says it in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the objects of his love. It's not a very flattering picture, is it? Uh, one of the hymns we sometimes sing it begins with, Beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand. And there are a few lines in that hymn which say this, Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonder of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. Um, I checked in the hymn books, which you use here, and that's the way it reads in both of those hymn books, the wonders of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. There are some other hymn books which render it a little bit differently, the wonders of his glorious love and my unworthiness. That begs the question, are we worthless or are we unworthy? Well, I'd be inclined to say that we're not worthless. We are created in the image and the glory of God. There is something dignified about human life, something special about humankind. And so, in that sense, we're not, we're not worthless. We're God's creation. But there isn't any question about it. We are unworthy. But God demonstrates his love towards us. And the Lord Jesus Christ died for us.
It's something which is emphasized throughout scripture, isn't it? This, uh, this thought that uh, God loves the unworthy. Uh, let me give you a couple of illustrations. One is from the Old Testament and one from the New. One of my favorite characters in the Old Testament is Jacob. Uh, you may choose uh, Joseph or uh, Abraham or David. I'm inclined to think about Jacob. Uh, and I like Jacob for a couple of reasons. And uh, one is this, that the Lord loved him. He wasn't a very nice guy. He wasn't worthy. The Lord loved him. Indeed, Jacob is the only man in Scripture whom God refers to by name and says, Jacob I have loved. Someone has said, well, it goes on to say, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And they say, can't understand why God would hate Esau. Someone else responded, well, I'm not surprised God would hate Esau. I'm amazed that he would love Jacob. He was a rascal, wasn't he? He was, uh, he was a cheat. He was a manipulator. He was selfish. He did his own thing. And yet, and yet the, Lord, the Lord loved him. The other thing I like about him is that the Lord changed him. There are these two truths about Jacob which really stand out and which I enjoy one. Okay, he was unworthy and the Lord loved him and the Lord did not give up on him. And by the time you get to the end of his story, he's, uh, he's not Jacob, he's Israel. He's a prince with God. He has power with God and with men. He's altogether changed. Not, not because of Jacob suddenly turn over, turning over a new leaf. No, because God loved him. God did something with him. He was unworthy, but the Lord loved him. An illustration from the New Testament is in John chapter 13, which begins with the statement that the Lord Jesus uh, loved his own, which were in the world. And uh, later on, uh, he washes their feet, you remember, in the upper room. And then he speaks to them about his departure. And uh, he tells them, you're to love one another as I have loved you. They, they weren't deserving, certainly not. I mean, if you think about them, even that last night, as the Lord Jesus speaks these words, a short time before, they had been discussing among themselves who was going to be the greatest. I mean, that was their, that was their thinking. And that's what was important, who would be the greatest. And the Lord Jesus says to them, I, I'm going away. They have no idea what he's talking about. They were slow to understand, weren't they? I mean, he had told them repeatedly at least three times in successive chapters in Mark's gospel, we have it, that the Lord Jesus told them that uh, he's going up to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. He's going to be put to death and he will rise again. And they didn't want to hear they shut it out of their minds. It was something that uh, they didn't want to think about. And so Jesus said, I'm going away. Well, where, where are you going? They didn't understand. They were slow. I don't mean to pick on them. I'm not suggesting that I would have been smarter or quicker than they. And certainly not. But they were slow to understand. Others understood, I think. Mary of Bethany, I think she understood. She, if you remember, she poured out that oil upon him. And the Lord says, against the day of my burying, she has done this. There was a, I think there was some kind of awareness on Mary's part that uh, something was going to happen. But the disciples, they were slow to understand, even then in the upper room. And they were, um, well, they recognized their unworthiness. The Lord says, one of you is going to betray me. And, you know, it doesn't say, well, they said, well, is it Judas? <laughs> It says that to a man, they pointed to themselves and they said, Lord, is it I? They were aware of their unworthiness. Moreover, in that uh, same situation, the Lord Jesus says to them, you know, you're all going to forsake me and flee. And Peter, of course, was the spokesman. He says, no, you can count on me. The others, well, they went along with him and they agreed with that. You can count on us. But you remember what happened. They all forsook him and fled. They were... They were unworthy. And yet we are told that the Lord Jesus loved his own, which were in the world. He loved them to the end. Unworthy. He loves us not because of what we are, but in spite of what we are. 
Dr. Bernardo was the founder of a number of um, uh, children's homes in the UK. I don't remember how many of them, but uh, there was one in the town next to where Naomi used to live in Scotland. And uh, a number of those uh, I met and uh, they came to know the Lord. And uh, it was a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous ministry. On one occasion, Dr. Bernardo was in London and this uh, little fellow, he approached him and he said to him, I asked him if he could be taken into one of the homes. Dr. Bernardo says, well, I, I don't know who you are. I don't know anything about you, my lad. What do you have to recommend you? And so the boy, uh, he pointed to his rags and he says, I thought these would be enough. Well, we can only point to our rags. There's no reason why God should love me. There's no reason why God should love you. We can point to our rags. We're ungodly. We're sinners. We're enemies. We're without strength. But God loved us. So these are the objects of our love. But then secondly, notice the expression of God's love. And he says it three times. He says it, first of all, in verse 6, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There is the expression of his love. Christ died for the ungodly. You notice he says there, in due time, uh, the ESV says, at the right time, at the right time. It would suggest, wouldn't that, that, um, that God had a schedule. And God knew exactly what was going to happen down the road, and, uh, and he had his schedule. He didn't send the Lord Jesus, did he, in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. He didn't send the Lord Jesus immediately to die on our behalf. There was nothing of that. But uh, at the right time, Galatians 4 says, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son. God does things on schedule. And that was true when it came to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was according to God's timetable. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then he says it again in verses 7 and 8. He says in verse 7, For a righteous man, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, some woman even dare to die. Now, the, the language he uses implies that uh, there may be somebody who merits the description righteous, and there may be somebody who merits the description good. There is, Paul is saying here, surely, that there is such a thing as a, as a righteous man. There is such a thing as a good man. We might wonder about that, because earlier in this letter, he says in chapter 2, there is none righteous, no, not one. And moreover, he says there is none that does good. And, uh, and so why would he then use this language here? The Lord Jesus, on one occasion, he was approached by a young fellow who said, good master, what must I do to, you know, to inherit eternal life? And the Lord says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Only God is good. Only God is thoroughly, intrinsically, altogether good. He always does the right thing. He is God who is good in the sense that morally he, 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 has, he is just and he is holy. And uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, he's benevolent and he's kind. God is good. Only God is good. Only God is truly good. Nevertheless, these words are sometimes used in a, in a relative sense about men and women. And so we read, for example, that Joseph of Arimathea was a, was a good man. We read about Barnabas, that Barnabas, he was a, he was a good man. We're told about Zacharias, Zacharias and Elizabeth, that they were righteous before the Lord. And so in a relative sense, it is possible that someone might be described as righteous or good. The difference between them may well be that uh, a righteous man is somebody who does what he, he does what he should. He keeps the law. Uh, he pays his debts, pays a hundred cents in the dollar, and uh, he can be depended upon to do the right thing. A good man is somebody who does more than that. He is benevolent, and he's kind, and he's generous. The righteous man, I think we might say that he does what he ought, gives everyone, everyone his due. He does what he ought. A good man, he goes beyond that. 
and he gives in the interest of assisting and helping other people. Perhaps, perhaps for a righteous man, question mark. Perhaps for a righteous man, someone would die. But perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. I am sure many of you have read uh, Charles Dickens' uh, A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, if you are familiar with that, it tells us the story of two men, Charles Darney and Sidney Carton, who were somewhat alike physically and uh, in other ways, I dare say. And they had this in common, that they both loved a young lady by the name of Lucy Manette. And, uh, well, she had the wisdom to choose the right man, and she married Charles Darney. Turned out that Darnay was a French aristocrat. And he was in France, he was in Paris uh, during the revolution. And he was recognized and arrested and condemned. And he was put, put in the Bastille, condemned to go to the guillotine. And Sidney Carton heard about it. And Sidney Carton decided he would do something about it. And so he went to Paris and uh, somehow he got uh, admitted to the prison and the cell where uh, Charles Darney was and uh, changed clothes with him and sent Darney on his way. And Charles Darney was free. And Sidney Carton, some time later, went to the guillotines saying, it is a far, far better thing that I do now than I have ever done. Perhaps, perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die, but, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Died for the ungodly. He died for the sinners. He says it again in, uh, in, uh, in verse 10. He says, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. We were, we were enemies. Reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan. You remember the Lord Jesus told that in response to a, uh, a man who asked him, well, who's my neighbor? And he, uh, he told them that story to make the point that basically my neighbor is someone who is in a position of need and I'm, and I'm in a place to help him. That's my neighbor. But we sometimes use that as an illustration of, uh, of the gospel. There was this man, you remember, he goes from Jerusalem to Jericho well, uh, some thieves, they, uh, they see fit to, uh, to assault him and uh, they steal what he has and they beat him up and he's left there by the roadside half dead. And along comes the priest and the Levite and uh, they, just, they just keep on going. And then along comes a Samaritan. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. They're enemies. If we could have excused anyone for going by and ignoring the man, it is, uh, it is the Samaritan. But the Samaritan had compassion. He came where the man was. And uh, he got down and he, uh, he ministered to him. He poured in oil into his wounds, bathed his wounds, and uh, bound them up and took him on his donkey to a place where he might be cared for. Well, we were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. I referred earlier to that hymn and to those words that uh, two wonders I confess, the wonder of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. The two wonders I would suggest, the first wonder is this, that, uh, that he would love the likes of me. The second wonder is that he would love me so much that he would die for me the expression of divine love. And so first of all, then, we have the objects of God's love, and then we have the expression of God's love, and then thirdly, we have the outcome of God's love. And Paul says it twice over. He says it in verse 9, and then again in verse 10. And you'll notice that in both places, he, he argues from the, the greater to the lesser. Notice in verse 9, much more than. And uh, again in verse 10, towards the end of the verse, much more having been reconciled. He, he's arguing from, from the greater. He's saying this is, this is something great that, has, that, that, is, that God has done for us. 
And if he has done this greater thing for us, much more, he's going to do the lesser thing. And so in verse 9, what has God done for us? Much more having now been justified by his blood. That's, that's the greater thing. That's the greater thing. We were sinners, and uh, we are declared righteous. We're brought into a relationship with God, and the righteousness of Christ is, uh, is uh, imparted to us or imputed, reckoned to us. Uh, we, and that's the greater thing. Well, then, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, surely he will do the lesser thing. We shall be saved from wrath through him. In other words, He's not going to abandon us. He's already done the greater thing. He has saved us uh, as a result of the blood that was shed at Calvary. He has saved us. He has justified us. He's not going to give up on us. Much more, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And then he says it again in verse 10. He says, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. That's the greater thing. There's the greater thing. We, we were sinners and we were justified. Now he says we were enemies and we've been reconciled. We've been brought into this relationship with God. There's the greater thing. Much more than he says at the end of verse 10, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's what we were singing about in our opening hymn, because he lives, because he lives, we shall be saved by his life. What he's telling us is that the Lord Jesus is alive. The Lord Jesus went into death. The Lord Jesus uh, conquered death. The Lord Jesus emerged victorious and rose from the grave. And because that is so, we can be sure that we shall be saved by his life. But the message of these two verses is simply this, that uh, because of his love for us, we can never be lost. God has done the greater thing. Well, he's not going to give up on us. He will surely do the lesser. Let me illustrate it from the Old Testament, uh, from maybe your favorite character, Joseph. A, a, a tremendous, tremendous story and uh, a very, very outstanding individual. Uh, at, right at the end of the book, uh, Jacob dies. And Joseph's brothers, uh, Joseph and his brothers, they take the body to Canaan. They bury, they bury him there in the land of Canaan. And then they return to, uh, to Egypt. And we're told that uh, Joseph's brothers were, were quite anxious. And they have a bit of a discussion, and they say, perhaps Joseph will hate us. And they didn't even want to approach Joseph, and so they, they got somebody else to go in and to intercede and uh, told him what to say. And he went before Joseph, and he says, you know, your father, before he died, he says that uh, you were to be sure to, to look after your brothers. And Joseph wept. Joseph wept. Perhaps he was thinking, well, is this what they think of me? <laughs> they think I'm going to turn around now, and uh, I only treated them nicely because uh, Jacob was around? Is that what they think of me? Or it may be that he felt for them. He may, he may be feeling for them in their, in their anguish and their distress. And so, and so he weeps, and he invites them to come in, and we're told that uh, he, spoke, he spoke kindly to them. He comforted them. Basically, what he did was he reminded them of what had happened in the past. They had been saved. How had they been saved? They had been saved because, uh, well, <laughs> they had sold Joseph as a slave into the land of Egypt. And uh, Joseph said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And so the result of it all is that uh, God meant it for good in order to save many people. And so that's what happened. God brought me to the right place at the right time. And as a result of that, you've been saved. I brought you and dad and, uh, and the whole family and everything you had. I brought you down to Egypt and I provided for you. That's the greater thing. You think I'm going to turn around now and take vengeance on you? I will surely continue to provide for you. Nothing could change his attitude towards them. He was their savior. And they were secure. Their salvation wasn't a temporary thing. It wasn't just a case that it lasted during those years that uh, Jacob lived uh, down in the land of Egypt, but it was something that was sure and ongoing because Joseph could not change. Well, God has done the greater thing for us. 
it means that we can be assured that he will do the lesser. There are some good folks. In fact, there are, there are many, many folks within evangelicalism who believe that they're saved today, but they're, well, I'm not sure about tomorrow. You know, I might mess up. Uh, this business of the eternal security of the believer, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous teaching because that might, that might lead to reckless living. And so I have, to, I have to hold on. I have to make sure that I stay f faithful. Otherwise, at the end of the day, perhaps God will hate me. Surely not. Surely not. What kind of God would he be? If having sent his son, and through his son, having justified us, made us righteous, declared us righteous, and having reconciled us and brought us into this relationship with himself, what kind of God would he be if at the end of the day he turned around and says, I'm sorry, but you messed up. And uh, yeah, yeah, okay, you believed in me for a while, but that's not enough. What kind of God would he be if he would abandon us in such a way? Stories told of an old lady who was dying and uh, the pastor of her church came to visit her. And he wasn't quite sure where she stood in relation to the Lord. And so he asked her, um, he says, what would you say if you get to the gates of heaven and God won't let you in? And she kind of brushed him off. And so he repeated the question, repeated it several times. What would you say if you got to the gates of heaven and God would not let you in? And eventually she responded with these words. He has more to lose than I have. He has more to lose than I have. What kind of God would he be? He, when he goes back on his word, he has made promises. If he goes back on his word and, uh, and doesn't fulfill the promises that he's made, then it means that, uh, that God cannot be depended upon, that that God is unreliable, that that God is a liar cannot possibly happen. God has done the greater thing for us. He will surely do the lesser. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, God did not spare his own son. He delivered, him, he delivered him up for us all. Then he adds this, how shall he not then with him also freely give us all things? The outcome of God's love. And then in verse 11, just for a moment in closing, he mentions that we have a new joy, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God. It's about 100 years ago that George Cutting wrote a gospel tract, which, uh, I don't know, it may be the tract which has been uh, distributed to more people than any other. Safety, Certainty, and Enjoyment. You may be familiar with that uh, tract, still something that's in use today. And it was written to, uh, to, to get across this truth that a person can know for sure that they are saved and that they are on their way to heaven. Safety, certainty, and enjoyment. Well, that's what we have here in Romans chapter 5. We have safety. We have safety. Surely we do. We've been justified. We've been reconciled to God because of Christ's work. We have, we have certainty. We rejoice in hope and confidence in assurance of the glory of God. And we have enjoyment. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God. Now, we could take this back to verse 1, by the way. Notice that, that uh, at the, verse 2, rather. At the end of verse 2, he says, We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Uh, we rejoice, or we might translate it, we boast or we glory in hope of the glory of God. And then verse 3, and not only that, we also glory or boast or rejoice in tribulations. And now verse 11, and not only that, but we also glory or boast or rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We boast in God. Back in chapter 2, Paul said that about the Jewish people. He says they make their boast of God. They boast in God. And there it was a kind of uh, national pride, as though God was some kind of national possession. It was almost as though they were saying, 
Yeah, well, there are all kinds of gods in the world, and uh, the pagans, they have their gods, but Yahweh, the living and the true God, he's our God. And uh, they made God their boast. Well, that's not what Paul is saying here, is he? He's, he's not saying, well, there's something special about us. What he's saying, rather, is something special about God. We rejoice in God. We have reason to rejoice in what he has done. We were exposed to the wrath of God. He tells us that back in chapter 1. Now he says here that uh, we will be saved from wrath through him. He has told us already in this letter that we, we were guilty before God. Everyone was guilty. The whole world was guilty before God. But we now have access into this grace in which we stand. We were enemies of God. And we, we've been reconciled. We had come short of the glory of God. Now he tells us we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Back in chapter 2, he tells us that there is none who seeks after God. But now he says, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize what the Lord has done for us. And we celebrate that. We, we praise him. We worship him. We rejoice in him. In all that he has done. And in the work that he has begun, which he will surely complete when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The results of justification. We have a new relationship we have uh, peace with God. We have a new standing. We have access into this grace in which we stand. We have a new prospect. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have a new perspective. We haven't talked about that. But we rejoice even in, even in tribulations. We have a new assurance. God has done the greater thing for us. Well, he's surely going to complete what he's begun and do the lesser thing. And we have a new joy. We rejoice in God. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what it means to be righteous, declared righteous in your eyes, what it means to be justified. Thank you for the perfect work of a perfect Savior. And pray that this, uh, this morning, those of us who know him may, may indeed be rejoicing in you and what it is that you have done in the sending forth of your Son. We pray, Father, that if there's someone this morning who cannot really enjoy these blessings that are here in Romans chapter 5 because they've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, we pray and by your Spirit that you would make yourself known to them. Make them aware of their unworthiness. Make them aware of your love. Make them aware of the expression of your love and the death of the Lord Jesus. And this glorious truth that by trusting in him, they can have life and forgiveness and hope. We thank you for this time together. Pray your blessing on our uh, remaining activities this morning as we remember the Lord Jesus. We commit ourselves to you for this in his name. Amen.